title of our message today is Our Book, Part 42. And one of my slides today will need sound. So that's just a reminder to my audio visual department that there will be a slide that has sound. And again, I know that the next slide is prayer, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. But I hope when the prayer is over, we get our feedback. Father, we thank you for your love and your watch care and your many blessings. We humbly acknowledge our great need of your presence, not only in our lives, but in this room, not only in our hearts, but in our minds. We pray that you will expand our understanding and give us clarity of thought so that we can see clearly where you would guide each of our lives in that journey by your side from this place to your throne. I pray, Lord, that you'll not allow me to interfere with your message today. Please allow your words to flow across my lips and touch my heart and my understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Revelation 21, 6. Actually, I was going to read that before the prayer. So let me just go... I guess I better go back to do it. Revelation 21, 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. We've already had our prayer. So we go to Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. We have already seen in Revelation chapter 7, and if you weren't here when we were doing Revelation chapter 7, it is archived on Facebook, and you are welcome to go back and, and catch up with, to where we are. But we have seen that the 144,000 is a symbolic number representing a multitude too numerous to count. So we're not talking about only 144,000 people being ready for Jesus. But there's a reason the Bible uses that number as a symbol. And we talked about it already in Revelation 7, and I'm sure we'll talk about it some more before we're through with Revelation. But he looked, and that's what he saw. And they had their father, his fathers, that's God, had God's name written on their foreheads, as opposed to the mark of the beast, which is received either in the forehead or the hand. And we talked about that already last week and the week before, I believe. But the name in the Bible symbolizes Thank you. That was Raymond's voice. I know it was. Symbolizes character. That's why certain people in the Bible have their names changed. Because the Holy Spirit has given them a different character. And this is really telling us that these people have God's character in their thinking. God's character in their thinking. Did you know that was even possible? Paul told us we could have the mind of Christ if we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and guide us in our thoughts, words, and actions. And this text is telling us that we can have God's way of thinking in our mind. And I heard... So now we've involved seeing and hearing, two of the senses, two of the avenues to the soul. I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth translated without seeing death. In some denominations, the word translated won't have the right meaning, so 
raptured, if that's the way you want to think of it. They will be raptured before dying. And as a matter of fact, those people will never die. Verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women. Now, this is not talking about literally being celibate. It's a, this is spiritual, speaking spiritually. And Revelation is a book of symbols. So we have to ask ourselves, what is this symbol? What does this mean? And I wrote it over there on the side. It means they're not defiled by false doctrine. They actually understand and believe and accept and follow the truth as revealed by the Holy Spirit in God's word. So they have no apostasy, no heresy, no false doctrine. They really do get it and they see the truth and they allow the Holy Spirit to bring that into their life in a way that can be seen by those around them, much the way the character of God could be seen in the life of Jesus Christ. Redeemed from among men, from among the living. These are from among the people who will be alive when Jesus returns. Sadly, most of mankind will be crying for the rocks and the mountains to hide them. And they will not be ready for his coming because they didn't spend time with him before his coming. Verse 5, In their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The character of Christ is fully developed in them. Now, understand these are not my words. This is not my theology. This is not, this is not my take on it. <laughs> this is simply what the Bible is teaching. And the Bible is describing a group of people who have allowed the Holy Spirit to grow them into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. Very simply put, but that's exactly what it is. And I wish that I could go to verse 6 and verse 7, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I wish that because those are the two verses that Revelation has been leading us toward from the very beginning. They are the culmination of everything we've been studying. The fruition of God's plan for all of humanity. I wish I could go there. But we're not ready. Before we can truly understand what we're going to be studying, there are some things we must learn. And so today we're going to try to learn. We're going to try to gain some knowledge that will prepare us for verses 6 and 7 to be properly understood. Now we could go to verses 6 and 7 and I could tell you what I think they mean. And you might yawn or you might say, hey, that's a thought. Because it really doesn't matter what Pastor Woods thinks it means, does it? What matters is what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And so there's a little journey we need to take so that we can see clearly what he would have us understand when we get to verses 6 and 7. And I wish I could tell you we're going to do it next week. But I have a guest speaker next week and I have another guest speaker the week after that. So it's going to be three weeks from now before I can get to verses 6 and 7. And I'm letting you know that in advance so that you can lock this in. Keep this in your brain, because it's going to be a while before I get to use it in my next sermon. Isaiah 58, 1. Cry aloud. This is God speaking. He's speaking to Isaiah, but he's really speaking to all who follow Christ. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. 
Tell my people their transgression. What? He meant to say, tell the world, didn't he? Isn't that what God meant? Tell the world their transgression. Are there, are there transgressions out in the world? Surely that's what God meant. But wait a minute. Am I allowed to correct God? I'm not, am I? This is what he said, and this is him saying it. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So remember, I'm only following orders, and this is about us. Not about those people out there. This is about us. Verse 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. God is not happy. He is not happy with us. It's the reason he inspired that letter to Laodicea to be written. And we've already studied that letter. Verse 3, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? So this is a people who blame God for the shortcomings that we see all around us in the world. They blame God. You're saying that doesn't happen? Well, <laughs> what, is the, what do the insurance companies call it when there's a disaster? And when a child is run over by a car and killed, almost the first words you'll hear, why did God let that happen? We do blame God. And it's not God's fault. Why have we fasted and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, God is telling us, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Exploit all your laborers. Well, you may be thinking, I don't own a company. I don't have laborers. We all have laborers. People who serve us in restaurants, and at banks, and gas stations, and grocery stores. Everywhere we go, we have people who are making their living serving us. And we charge as much as we can, and we pay as little as we can, and we, and we think we're being good stewards, being frugal. Isn't that what Ellen White told us, that we should be frugal? And I've heard, I've heard that word misused so many times. Let's look at the quotation. If you will hide his word in your heart, you will not mistake the path of duty and of safety. That blessed book will teach you to be honest, temperate in all things, frugal, industrious, truthful, and upright. Its counsels heeded will make you a faithful companion of youth, giving you an influence that will ever lead upward to purity of character, an influence that will lead away from sin into paths of righteousness. So, among other things, she calls us to be frugal and honest. So let's look at those two words. Frugal means not wasteful. Honest means fair with others. And I could tell you so many stories that would be embarrassing for the people that I witnessed having those events in their lives, but I've actually had church members say, I couldn't, I didn't want to leave a very big tip at the table because I, I'll put that in my offering plate. I'll give that to God instead of the waitress. 
And, and in their mind, they are doing a righteous thing. They're, bring, they're being frugal for the Lord. No, you're not. You're being dishonest with a waitress. We're called to be frugal and honest, both. Not wasteful. In other words, don't order two orders of french fries at McDonald's and leave half of one. If you can't eat two, order one and be hungry a little while. It won't hurt, and I should be preaching to myself. I know that. Not wasteful and honest with others. Philippians 2.4 Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's what the Bible says. And Paul is writing to us, to each of us, each one of us. Back to Isaiah 58, verse 4. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. God is calling our motives into question. Do you think he understands our motives? Is God able to read our heart? Does he have a reason for what he says to us? He's not talking to people outside this room. He's talking to us. Unless, unless you want to tell me you're not his people. I mean, if you want to walk away and say, I'm not, I'm not, I don't belong to God, I'm not a Christian, I'm, just let me out of here. Then he's not talking to you. But if you want to be his people, if you want to be a part of his family, this is for you and me. I'm not talking down to anybody. I need it as much as anyone in the room. You fast for strife and debate, to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. There has to be a change, a change in what motivates us, what drives us. Fasting for strife and debate to strike with the fist of wickedness. I can remember being uh, in my early 20s. I know, that was a long time ago. I can actually, actually remember that time better than I can what happened last week. But I can remember being in my early 20s and, and I was the only Seventh-day Adventist in my neighborhood and, and uh, there were a couple of preachers from other churches in that neighborhood and, and their children would attack my theology, you know, uh, young people seem to have more interest in putting another person down. I don't know why, but. And I studied. What was my motive? Strife and debate. To strike with the fist of wickedness. To beat the other people down. Somewhere in my late 20s. I, I can't tell you exactly probably around 28, 29 years of age, it all of a sudden a light bulb came on and, and I realized, hey, I don't have to defend God. God is able to defend himself. I don't have to prove anything. I, I, I believe what the Bible says. I will allow the Holy Spirit to guide my life the way the Bible says I should. But if somebody else doesn't want to see it or can't see it, I can trust the Holy Spirit to reveal it. And funny thing, winning an argument never brought anybody into the baptistry. And that old saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, <laughs> comes to mind. And perhaps too many of us have been guilty of this. Only the Holy Spirit can give us an appropriate motive. It happens in the new birth, and it happens every morning as we recommit our lives each and every day. Isaiah 58, 5. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this an acceptable day to the Lord? We've been guilty of doing things our own way instead of doing them his way. And I'm going to have a quote for you here in a minute. Ellen told us, matter of fact, the minutes now, if we had done things God's way, 
we would be home now. If we had just done it his way, instead of trying to do it our way. And we do. Don't tell me we don't. I know better. You know better too, if you're honest. We try to do it our way. I've had people tell me they don't like the music. Now, not in this church. Not in this church. But I've had people tell me they don't like the music. It's too whatever. Too, it's too modern. Or it's too old-fashioned. Or whatever. You know, it's just too. And my response, over the years, I kind of developed this, and I like it because it, it lets me win and strife and debate. <laughs> I say it is the height of conceit for any person to think they know God's preference in music. I'm pretty sure his favorite singer is Willie Nelson. Now, I, I really say that. And, and everybody gets quiet when I say that. I don't know what God's favorite singer is. It's probably Eston back here. But that's not for us to decide. We don't need to, we don't need to focus in on those self-centered ideas. It's got to be my way or it's not going to be right. No, your way is not necessarily the right way. Uh, only my way. Yeah, you can laugh at that. I was joking. Verse 6. Is this not, now, this is God speaking, and he's telling us how it's supposed to be. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens? To let the oppressed go free? And that you break every yoke? Wow. What he's telling us is to quit chaining people to their, mis their mistakes. We've all made them. I, I, I cannot begin to tell you how many times I've sat in a board meeting and somebody's name comes up for an office and somebody else will say, yeah, they're talented that way. They could do that. But <laughs> you know what they did. No, I don't know. What did they do? And then I'll hear some story from 20, 25 years ago how they... Blah, blah, blah. Get over it. We've all made mistakes. None of us is perfect. Quit chaining people to their history. Break every yoke. Loose the bonds of wickedness. Let the oppressed go free. And he's going to reiterate this. It's not, this is, when, when God says it twice, you know he means it. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Now he's talking about literal bread. Sure, if you see somebody hungry, you should feed them or at least give them an opportunity to earn some bread. But he's also talking about spiritual food. If they don't understand the gospel, Who's supposed to tell them? I'm sorry. If they don't understand the gospel, who's supposed to tell them? Isn't that what we were called to do? Take this gospel to the world? Every kindred, tongue, people, every nation? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. The poor. Those who don't have the riches of heaven. They don't have that relationship with Jesus. And yeah, if they don't have any money, you can help them out that way too. But it's not really about that. And I can prove it to you in the next one. When you see the naked, that you cover him. All right. So when's the last time you were walking down the street and you saw somebody naked? I'm not saying it could never happen. We went through a spell where there were some streakers 
um, at sporting events and college campuses. And I'm not saying it could never happen, but how many have you seen walking around naked? Why would Jesus tell us that if we're never going to see one? He's not, he's not talking about literal. None of this is literal. I mean, it, there are literal applications, and yes, a Christian should help in literal ways. I'm not backing off of that. But this verse is spiritual. And being naked means we don't have the covering of Christ's robe of righteousness. It means we don't understand the gospel. It means we don't understand that God loves us no matter what. You don't have to earn his love. He loves you right now no matter what. That's the gospel. If somebody doesn't know that, they are naked. And we need to provide them with that covering. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. You know, the hardest people to witness to are those in your own home. You know why that is? Because they know the truth about you. It's hard to tell somebody to do right when they see you not doing it. So if you're not going to hide the gospel from those of your own home, you need to be living the gospel in your own home. Isaiah 58, 8. This is God speaking. Then. When? When we do it his way. Then. Your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. The glory of the Lord. That's the character of God. You will leave the character of God in your wake as you go through life. And the people who have experienced the contact with your life will see the glory of God in your actions, in your attitude, in the love that flows from you, through you. I shouldn't say from you because you cannot originate it. But you get to choose whether you let it flow through you and touch the lives of others. When we do it his way, that's his promise. Can God do it? Is he as good as his word? Is God a liar? Yeah, I'm glad nobody said amen on that one. He's not a liar. You're right. He's not. Then, we get another then. You shall call and the Lord will answer. You ever pray a prayer and you wonder if he actually heard it? We have a promise here. If you will let the Holy Spirit accomplish this in you, what we've been reading in you, doing it his way, he promises when we call, he will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke, remember I told you he was going to say it twice. Here it is. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness. She, he, I saw, shut up. That's what God is saying. Take away the yoke. Quit binding people to their past and their sins. Quit pointing your finger and speaking wickedness about other people. That's God's way. And by the way, that's what love is. That's the only way love is. Love isn't any other way. Isaiah 58.10 If you extend your soul to the hungry, remember it's spiritual now, and satisfy the afflicted soul. In other words, if somebody is physically hungry, you know, they really haven't eaten for three days and they need food. How much help is it going to be that I extend my soul to them? Unless, unless I caught some fish, you know, that was, you know, there is this fish called soul. Maybe I caught a soul and I gave them that. But that's not the way you spell. That's not the way you spell the fish. 
This is talking about sharing my relationship with the Lord, my soul. How much is that going to help if it's physical hunger? See, it's not about physical hunger. It's about a spiritual connection. And they're hungry because they don't have that connection. And if you are not connected to the Lord, you feel empty. You feel unhappy. And you feel the need of something more. And people try to fill that void in their life all kinds of ways. Inappropriate sexual alliances. Inappropriate visits to the local tavern. Inappropriate purchases from the local drug dealer. All kinds of ways trying to fill that void. None of them work. Your pastors tried them all. None of them work. Only Jesus can fill the void. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness. And your darkness shall be as the noonday. Isaiah prophesies about this in uh, chapter 30, verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. This is talking about the end of the world. This is talking about just before the second coming of Christ. The moon will be as the light of the sun. The light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Now that may have a literal fulfillment. I don't know. But I know it does have a spiritual fulfillment. Jesus is symbolized by the sun. He is the source of light. The moon symbolizes us. We reflect his light, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun. And as we grow, the sun, our understanding of the gospel, increases. So the sun is brighter. As our understanding grows, the light is brighter in our experience, in our minds, in our understanding. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to reflect that light from us, that light grows as well. And we're being told that at the end of that process, we will shine like the sun. Not my words. That's what the Bible says. Shine like the sun like Jesus when he was here. That's what the latter rain is all about. The former rain is the Holy Spirit working through people as he did through Jesus. But Jesus said, you will do greater things than I have done. Because the time is coming when the Holy Spirit will be poured out in our lives, and we're gonna look at it more closely in a moment, in latter rain power. And we will shine as Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Isaiah 58, verse 10. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. We will shine for Jesus. That's what we're being told. We will shine for him. If uh, somebody comes into a, a room and there's a candle and there's a spotlight, which will be seen first? Well, you may not even see the candle, even if it's lit, because the spotlight is giving off so much light. We will shine. And people's attention will be drawn to that shining the way it was drawn to the life of Jesus. Not everybody accepted him. The majority yelled, crucify him. I'm not saying that everybody's going to love you because you shine for Jesus. There's going to be a lot of people who hate you because you shine for Jesus. Are you going to let that stop you? I hope not. Revelation 14, 1 and 5 is realized right here. These people are shining for Jesus. And that's what we read. The first five verses in Revelation 14. People who are 
ready to deliver a message to the world. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This prophecy can be about you and me. It can be about us. Isn't that a pretty picture? Do you realize, do you realize that if there's no water, there's no life? Spiritually and physically both. Our bodies are about 80% water. We can dehydrate very quickly, and when we do, we will die. No water, no life. But spiritually, the water is a symbol for the Holy Spirit, the former and the latter rain. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we have not invited him in, if we do not listen to his voice, if we are not guided by his wisdom, we have no spiritual life. No water, no life. Isaiah 58, 12. Those from among you shall build. This is, God is still speaking. And he's speaking to his people. You and me, I hope. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of streets to dwell in. This prophecy should be about us. The foundation of God's kingdom. Faith, love, humility. Faith, foundation of Lucifer's kingdom. Pride, covetousness, and selfishness. Raise up the foundations. Humility, love, faith in God. Raise those foundations up in the estimation of all that we have to do with, in all of our business dealings, in all of our relationships, whether it be family, neighbors, commercial. This should be about us. So how does it happen that we become the fulfillment of this prophecy? Would you like to be the fulfillment of this prophecy? Everybody who doesn't want to be the fulfillment of this prophecy, go home or change the channel. But if you want to be the fulfillment, listen closely. The woman at the well is going to help us understand. John 4, 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The gift of God is his love, the gospel, salvation, eternal life. Who it is who says to you, give me a drink. In other words, we're to know him. And in order to know somebody, anybody, you have to spend time with them. You cannot get to know somebody if you don't spend time with them. Duh. That's why Lucifer tries so hard. I probably shouldn't call him Lucifer anymore. He's not an angel in heaven anymore. But that's why Satan tries so hard to take up all of our time. To keep us focused on all kinds of things that don't really matter. So that we can't spend time on the one thing that really does matter. Our relationship with him. Our walk with him. Our trust in him. To know him, we must spend time with him. And we give Jesus a drink. You know, he asked the Samaritan woman for a drink. We give him a drink every time we share the gospel with somebody. Isn't that what he said? In that you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it for me. You would have asked him and he would have given you. It's our job to ask. It's his job to give. He won't give unless we ask. It's not because he's selfish. It's just that he doesn't force. He, he doesn't force anything on us. 
he waits for us to make a request. Desire of Ages, page 195, paragraph 2, speaking of this interaction between Christ and the woman at the well. As soon as she had found the Savior, the Samaritan woman brought others to him. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. They did not see that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman whom they despised, a whole city full were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. If we receive the water of life, we must give the water of life. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. You shall be like a watered garden. Isaiah 58, 11. We read it a few moments ago. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Revelation 21, 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. The question is, do we thirst? We all thirst for something. We're all thirsty for something. Some of us want to win the lottery. Some of us want to take a trip around the world. Some of us want to spend the night with another man's wife. We're all thirsty for something. And to be fair, some of us want to spend the night with another woman's husband. I don't want to leave that one-sided. What do we thirst for? What are we thirsty for? He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's the symbol for the Holy Spirit, the water of life. In this, on planet Earth, the water of life is the Holy Spirit. Revelation 22, 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And there you have it. Let him who hears say to others, come. It's here for you, come. Revelation chapter 2. I'm not going to re-preach this. We've already covered it. So this is just a little look back, a little reminder. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And we looked at the fact that the angel, the word means messenger. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary, not given up. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. 
lost focus. I dare say that Chris and Anna still feel their first love today. But I'm afraid many of us have lost it. And somehow we think that what happened years ago is going to sustain us now. Not true. This experience must occur every day. Every morning we give our hearts to him again. Every morning we ask him to guide our thoughts, our words, our actions. Every morning we seek to be an ambassador of his kingdom of love. Every morning we trust that he will bring his love into reality in our life. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. Now, I've given you a definition of repent before, but it was a long time ago, and I'm not going to embarrass anybody by asking you. You could say it's sorry, be sorry, that's not repent. Repentance is a gift. It comes from God. You cannot originate it. But it simply is what I have typed there in the corner box. Allowing the Holy Spirit to show you your sin through God's eyes. Somehow, the devil is able to convince us that our sin is different. Our sin is nice. Everybody else's sin is evil. I don't have any problem looking at somebody else who's committing adultery and, and thinking, well, they are just awful people. But when I commit adultery, it's because I love more than one person. It's just love. That's all it is. Love. Yeah, right. Allowing the Holy Spirit to show you your sin through God's eyes. And when you see its ugliness, you will no longer be attracted to it. I don't have time to preach. That's a whole sermon. I, I just don't have time to preach. I have preached that sermon before. As a matter of fact, it's archived on our Facebook page when I preached Revelation chapter 2. But it says... I will come quickly to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's lose your salvation. You will be cut off from the kingdom of heaven. Unless you allow the Holy Spirit to show you your sin through God's eyes. So that you can really appreciate how ugly it is. And no longer be attracted to it. I... I my time is running out, but I, I, the Holy Spirit's telling me I need to make this clear. Nobody going to heaven is going to get there because they had a, a good willpower. And even though they wanted to, you know, fill in the blank, I don't care, any sin you want to name. Even though they wanted to do it, they didn't. They were strong and they stood up for the Lord and they didn't do it. That, that, that doesn't get you into the kingdom. The fact that you could resist temptation, temptation for 80 years on this earth does not mean that you can resist that same temptation for 80 million years in the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't mean that. Everybody who's going to be in the kingdom of heaven has allowed the Holy Spirit to show them how ugly sin is. And they're no, they no longer want it. Put a glass of Jack Daniels in front of me. I'll pour it down the sink every time. I don't want it anymore. Put a nickel bag here. I'm not going to light up. I don't want it. I'm not saying I'm your example. I'm just saying the Holy Spirit can change us. So that the things that looks, used to look so pretty to us don't look pretty anymore. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That's a 
top-down power structure. I went through that when I preached that sermon. Nicolaitan, made up of two words. Nico means power over. Laetan is talking about the laity. This kind of theology eventually led to having a pope over the church. The guy at the top makes all the decisions. Everybody else has to obey. God hates that because there's not one single person in the human race who deserves that kind of authority. God is the head of the church. Nobody else. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It's another whole sermon I don't have time to preach. But if you share what you've been shown, that makes you an overcomer. You, if you believe in the goodness of God, you're going to be more likely to share him. If you think he's an evil tyrant waiting to zap people as soon as they mess up, you're probably going to keep him to yourself. Or if you do tell people about him, it will be, you'll give the wrong picture. So it would be better if you did shut up. But if you understand how good he is, how loving he is, how much he wants us in his family, if you, if you understand that, and have that kind of a relationship with him, and you share it with others, then you are an overcomer. Because it's the devil that tries to stop you from doing that. 2 Kings 7, 9. Samaria, the city of Samaria had been surrounded by a Syrian army. Four lepers standing outside the walls of the city decided to venture into the camp of the Syrians. They found it deserted because God had sent the sound of two armies and scared the enemy soldiers away. And they discovered in that camp everything that the city needed. Food, clothing, gold and silver. And they started burying it. Accumulating it for themselves. Digging holes. Hiding it. And then they came to their senses. Well, at least one of them did. And then they all agreed with him. And they said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, the gospel. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. The king's household is made up of all who will accept the gospel. But they have to be shown the gospel before they can accept it. If we're not sharing it, it's because we don't have it, plain and simple. Perhaps you're thinking you don't have the right words to speak. Luke 12, 11 and 12. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry. Have faith about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. He's not looking for people who know all the answers. Who do you think has all the answers? God, he doesn't need you to have all the answers. He already has those. What he needs is for you and I to be willing for him to speak through us, to share his love through us. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in all who will receive him. John 5, 30, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus didn't seek his own will? Let that sink in for just a minute. Jesus, Jesus didn't seek his own will? And we do? That's kind of crazy, isn't it? He didn't and we do? When we do, we make ourselves God. We become our own God. When we humbly accept his will, he remains our God. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. 
So even Jesus was given the words that he spoke. And notice that his words and his works are interchangeable. Same thing. Our words and our works need to match, is what the verse is telling us. I and them, this is Jesus' prayer, last recorded prayer before Gethsemane. I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Remember, we're talking about the first five verses of Revelation 14. We're talking about the character of the people who are able to deliver the last message this world will hear before the second coming. The hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. To them God will to make known what the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul labored for Christ to be born in us. There it is. Galatians 4.19. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. He labored for Christ to be born in us. He labored for Christ to be formed in us. Not half formed, but fully formed. If we're to have this experience, two things have to happen. Exodus 14, 15, the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. This was impossible. They had a mountain range on either side and the Red Sea before them. They couldn't go forward. It was impossible. God was asking the impossible. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. God was providing the impossible. Never be bothered because God has asked you to do the impossible. Just watch as he provides the impossible. Crossing the Red Sea symbolized escape from the power of sin, and it took a miracle. 2 Peter 1, 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped. We're talking about Revelation 14, 1 through 5. The people described there, the ones who can deliver the last message to a dying world that you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Then, having escaped that corruption of Egypt, the corruption of Egypt, the faith of Christ's followers must grow. And that's what Hebrews 10, 14 tells us. You're all familiar with that by now. Joshua 3, 13, it shall come to pass... As soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. So they crossed the Red Sea at the beginning of their journey. Now they're at the end of their journey. They're going to cross the Jordan River. But notice this. That the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream and they shall stand as a heap. This time... They have to get their feet wet. When they crossed the Red Sea, it was on dry ground. This time, they have to get their feet wet. They have to step into the water before it parts. They had to exercise more faith. Crossing the Jordan symbolized entrance into the heavenly Canaan. This is translation without seeing death or rapture without seeing death. And Ezekiel puts it this way. Follow closely. Ezekiel 47.1 He brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, in other words, toward the second coming of Christ, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. You, you may remember that 
God put the sheep on his right side and the goats on his left side. And we're being shown that the Holy Spirit flows through the sheep, the ones that are on the right side of the altar. Matthew 25, 33, he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. There you have it from Matthew. Ezekiel 47, 2, he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. The Holy Spirit only flows through the sheep. He does not flow through the goats on the left side. And when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. So Jesus is coming from the east. We're moving towards the second coming, walking towards the east. And now the water has come up to our ankles. And there's a little bit of resistance, but it's not hard to walk in ankle deep water. And we begin to use the faith God has given to every person. Ezekiel 47, 4, first part, again he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. More resistance, symbolizing the need to use more of the faith God has given all of us. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, and it came up to my waist. Still more resistance and the need to lean more upon the power of God. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep. Now we need the faith of Jesus. We can't do it. Not possible for us to do it. Water in which one must swim. And this is the place in the Bible where we get to go swimming with Jesus. We're exercising his kind of faith. And a river that could not be crossed without exercising that kind of faith. This is what it means to have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. This is a picture of the redeemed. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's the picture. And now we've seen what it means to have the faith of Jesus, to go swimming with Jesus. 4,000 years are represented here. I don't know if you counted them, but four times he went 1,000 cubits and the water got deeper and deeper. I believe that symbolizes, when I say I believe, that means I don't have a text to back me up. This is just what I think. I believe that symbolizes the 4,000 years from the first destruction of this earth to the second destruction of this earth, the second coming. 4,000 years. That 4,000 years symbolizing the time in which we live. We're at the end of that, by the way. It ends, actually, on 2027. In 2027, that time will be up. I'm not saying that that's the date. I'm not setting a date. For one thing, the Bible says that he will cut it short in righteousness or no flesh will be saved. So if anything, I'm telling you he's coming before 2027. But I'm not even saying that. I'm not trying to pinpoint it. But I can tell you we are very close to the end of this world as we know it. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. What we've seen is a pictorial representation of the process of sanctification, which is growing in our willingness to simply trust God until we have no choice. The water's too deep. We can't even make it. We have to swim with Jesus. Luke 18, 8, last part. When the Son of Man comes, this is Jesus talking, asking a question. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? I believe this was his greatest concern. When I come back to earth, will anybody just trust me? Have faith in me? Ezekiel 47, 7. When I returned there along the bank of the river, were very many trees on one side and the other, assembled for believers. Two sides of the river, those who are resurrected, those who are translated. Psalms 92, 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. 
He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The tree is a symbol for the redeemed, for the righteous. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. Notice that it goes to the whole world. That's the sea. Nations, multitudes, peoples, every kindred tongue and people. And people are healed. As they allow the river to flow in their life, they are healed by those waters. These are still the people in Revelation 14, 1 through 5. This is the Holy Spirit in latter rain power. These are the people who will deliver the three angels' message of Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We have been trying to deliver that message for more than 150 years. But we have not been the people of Revelation 14, 1 through 5. I'm sorry, we haven't. And we have not been able to deliver the message. It will be delivered in latter rain power by the people who fit this description. After these things, this is another picture, a look back from Revelation 18. It's another picture of the same group. I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. In other words, with his character. His character was seen in the people who are delivering the message. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. This is talking about the earth made new. When we inhabit the new earth, this is a picture of what it will be like. We need to let that river flow in us. I would be perfectly happy listening to it again, but I think I need to just have my closing prayer and uh, leave you with that thought. We haven't done it. There would have been no letter to Laodicea if we had done this. It's what Ellen White was talking about when she said, if we just did it God's way, it would be over. Don't you think it's time for it to be over? Let's let that river flow in our lives. Father, we thank you that you haven't given up on us. We failed you so many times. And you always are there. You have everything necessary except our willingness. That's it. Our willingness. It's the only thing holding up your plan, gumming up the works, getting the, in the way of you bringing an end to this dark, dark, sinful world. And Lord, we want that river to flow. Let it flow through us and accomplish your purpose everywhere we go. Let it bring life to all it touches, just as you promised it would. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.